And I'm Michael Dorff from Brigham Young University, and I am introducing, I have great honor to introduce Deanna Hansberger, who is the, who is the president of the Mathematical Association of America, and as a corollary is a professor in Minnesota at, <laughs> at Carleton College. Um, Deanna is known for her interest and success in increasing the number of students who pursue advanced degrees in mathematics. And that passion has guided her um, as former co-editor of the Math, Math Horizons and as co-founder and co-director of the Carleton uh, Summer Mathematics Program for Women. Um, <laughs> And their corresponding fan club. <laughs> and I have, and, and I want to briefly mention that I first heard of Deanna through the Carleton program. Um, and ever since I have been, I look up to her as a great example for the successful things that she has done in encouraging women and helping women go on in mathematics. The, um, Deanna is a fellow of the AWM and a recipient of their M. Gwyneth Humphreys Award for Mentoring. She's married to fellow mathematician Steve Kennedy, and together they have two grown children. Deanna. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning. Oh, let me try that again. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome to our community. You are not alone. You belong here. These are powerful words. Could they be powerful enough to make traction on the age-old problem of underrepresentation by women and people of color in the field of mathematics? We like to think that what matters in doing mathematics, becoming a mathematician, being successful as a mathematician, is just the mathematics. That puts us all on a level playing field where we're just compared by or judged by the mathematics that we produce or discover, the way we have for explaining mathematics to others and reaching them where they are. But we all know that that would only be true if we all started on a level playing field and had the same experiences in our classrooms and professional lives, and we don't. I want to talk to you about the importance of mathematical communities, about the importance of feeling like we belong, and about the power that increasing feelings of community and belonging can have to make progress on changing the face of mathematics. Michelle Obama wrote <clears throat> in her book, Becoming, at Princeton, I needed my black friends. We provided one another relief and support. Performing as well as everyone else is doable, of course. Minority and underprivileged students rise to the challenge all the time. But it takes energy. It takes energy to be the only black person in a lecture hall or one of a few non-white people trying out for a play or joining an intramural team. It requires effort, an extra level of confidence to speak in those settings and own your presence in the room. She was speaking of finding her community at Princeton. A community is a group of people sharing a common interest or characteristics that is perceived as or perceives itself different from the larger society in some way. There are all kinds of mathematical communities, those based on field like the special interest group on the history of math, on geographic area like the north central section of the MAA, on stage of career like the Project Next Peach Dots. All communities like this allow their members to focus on issues of importance to them where one of the major variables between them is eliminated. Communities normalize our experiences. They are equivalence classes, if you will, allowing for members to find more commonality and focus on issues of common interest instead of being distracted by characteristics that divide us. One type of community that plays a critical role in the future of mathematics is one whose members are from groups typically underrepresented in mathematics. If you are a woman or a person of color, one way of increasing your identification with a group of mathematicians is to be part of a community where you are in the majority. 
Those of us who are members of underrepresented groups know the sheer comfort of finding yourself in a situation where you're surrounded by mathematicians who look like you. An alumna of my summer women's program, now in graduate school, said, It was wonderful to participate in a community where everyone liked math and where wanting to go for a Ph.D. wasn't some weird, special, ambitious thing to do, but just a normal career option. It was all the more valuable for the fact that I also didn't have to worry about monitoring myself to fit in despite being a woman. I was surrounded by all sorts of women I could relate to, admire, and learn from. Keeping in touch with SMP has really helped me stay determined to continue pursuing my Ph.D. It's not surprising that it's more comfortable to be in a community of friends. As much as we like to think about homotopy theory or quandles, we're still animals, not that evolved from our wild ancestors, and much of our brain function is still put towards scanning for food, sex, and danger. This is not a passive exercise where we find ourselves in situations where we feel like an outsider. We use our mental energy to monitor for threats. We scan the room looking for signs that we are in danger or we are under attack. That brain capacity, then, is not being used for higher-order thinking. But it's not just our brain that's being strained. When our body is experiencing stress, the hypothalamus, which governs the body's hormonal stress response, mediates the release of the body's stress hormone, cortisol, excessive levels of which cause cardiovascular disease, depression, and, at least in rats, the death of neurons. Cohn, Schaefer, and Davidson showed that when friends or loved ones are nearby, our bodies react less to stress. Furthermore, unmet social needs are associated with eroded arteries, high blood pressure, and irregular circulatory functions. Being a part of a friendly, non-threatening community is healthier for your body and frees up brain capacity. Another SMP participant said, studying mathematics in a group of women students is the best. People explained things so that others would understand, and people kept telling each other, good call, great idea, or you're brilliant. You don't hear that studying with guys. It is very reassuring to discover that almost everyone else has the same insecurities and self-doubts. And when you realize everyone else's are unfounded, it starts to chip away at your own. However, even more important than community itself is the understanding that we belong to the community. We belong. We have a mathematical home where we are welcome. Belonging allows us to level the playing field and opens us to the possibility to see how high we can go when we don't have little voices whispering to us that this is not our game. We shouldn't be playing at all. We don't belong. This is not a new idea. Oswald Veblen, in his address to the International Congress of Mathematicians in Boston in 1950, acknowledged this very thing. Every human being feels the need of belonging to some sort of group of people with whom he has common interests. What is belonging? The extent to which an individual feels accepted, valued, and legitimate within the community. A popular framework in sociology research, Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, describes the hierarchical ordering of basic human needs. It contains belonging as a need that must be met in whole or part before feeling of accomplishment and achieving one's full potential can occur. Our sense of health happiness, well-being, and motivation is tied to whether or not we belong to a community. A lack of community, that is isolation or loneliness, can harm a person's intellectual achievement, immune function, and health. Research has shown that even a single instance of exclusion can affect one's well-being, IQ test performance, and self-control. Gregory Walton conducted a series of studies demonstrating that a sense of belonging can affect motivation and persistence, even on impossible tasks. And what can feel more impossible at times than one's own research? Angela Duckworth says not talent, but a special blend of passion and persistence is the secret to outstanding achievement. In other words, without feeling like you belong in a community, you are less likely to hang in there when obstacles arise less likely to find the inner fortitude to continue, less likely to make outstanding achievements. The lack of a sense of belonging may explain much of the underparticipation by marginalized groups in mathematics. 
It's not surprising that you might opt out of a field in which you feel unwelcome or undervalued. Good, Ratten, and Dweck suggest that viewing mathematical talent as something one is either born with or not, or viewing mathematical ability as something that can be learned, may affect a person's ability to see themselves as belonging in a mathematical classroom or not. They were able to show that sense of belonging, even more strongly than identification with domain, such as, I am a math person, had the power to predict one's academic persistence. London and colleagues found that women who reported a lower sense of belonging in their STEM majors were more likely to switch out of their majors. <clears throat> Seymour and Hewitt interviewed women who left STEM majors and found that common reason was that women felt like outsiders in the traditionally male-dominant STEM fields. Unfortunately, this can fall into a negative feedback loop. Belonging is such an important human need we are all constantly monitoring our belonging status. When someone has a low sense of belonging, any cues from their daily lives, a poor grade on an exam, peers questioning their choice of major, microaggressions within the classroom or department, they may further erode their security in belonging. But once someone is uncertain of their belonging, they may look for other evidence that they don't belong. And they may interpret ambiguous events as more evidence. This may impact women more because when men question if they belong, they can look around themselves and see male role models and positive stereotypes to quell their uncertainties. Again, in Becoming, Michelle Obama said, it's hard to put into words what sometimes you pick up in the ether, the quiet, cruel nuances of not belonging, the subtle cues that tell you to not risk anything, to find your people and just stay put. People who are unsure or stressed about their belonging then have less time to spend doing mathematics because too much of their mental time and energy is spent on concerns that they do not belong in mathematics. A participant in the Infinite Possibilities Conference said, I think that that particular conference is a good, great place for anybody who is sort of questioning, did they really belong? Is this really the right place for me? Are there people like me who do this kind of thing? And I think it was a great place to just get reinforcement that if this is something you really like and you're willing to work hard at, there are people here who want to help you. And there are people that look like you that agree with the things that you're interested in, that are willing to support you on your path. Where do we find communities in mathematics? In 2018, the Mathematical Association of America updated its core values statement to be more aligned with who we are. Included among our core values are building and strengthening community and advocating inclusivity and celebrating diversity by promoting mathematics for all. That is, we welcome all mathematicians and all mathematical enthusiasts into our community. The MEA supports a number of communities which resonate with the geographic location, interests, and career stage of our members. For example, every MEA member belongs to one of the MEA's 29 sections. From our smallest section, with just under 100 members and perhaps the longest name, Nebraska and Southeastern South Dakota, to our largest, Southeastern, with just over 2,000 members, each section has its own personality and traditions. Some have annual art exhibits or student poster sessions. Some meet all in one big room, and some have parallel sessions. Some meet for one day, and others make a weekend of it. All have engaging talks, an opportunity for old friends to break bread together or share pizza or if you're in Louisiana, eat fried catfish and hush puppies, and ways to welcome in new members of the community through professional development for young faculty and scavenger hunts or contests for students. Lisa Morano of the Epidel section said, For me, I think our section is so strong because we recognize and celebrate each other's talents and strengths and build from them. We value the energy and enthusiasm our new members along with the fresh ideas they have, while at the same time we place in high regard the knowledge and history that comes from those who have been with the section for years. We recognize as a community we cannot survive and thrive without both ends of the spectrum and all those in between having their voices heard and having a seat at the table. The special interest groups of the MAA, or SIGMAs, 
are opportunities for folks with similar research or teaching or mathematical interests to exchange ideas with each other. Seventeen sigmas have formed in the past 19 years, from the oldest sigma room, research in undergraduate mathematics education, to the three established in 2018, recreational mathematics, mathematical knowledge for teaching, and sports. <clears throat> Some of these sigmas meet regularly. Others communicate through list servers and newsletters. Any member of the MAA is welcome to join a sigma and contribute to the conversations. Cynthia Huffman said, History of Mathematics Sigma is a wonderful source of knowledge and community spirit. Members encourage each other, celebrate accomplishments, and are quick to answer questions on the discussion list. Belonging to a diverse, supportive group of people bonded by the common appreciation of the history of mathematics is empowering. The Project Next community was formed by Chris Stevens and Jim Leitzel in 1994 as a way of talking to new faculty about the many joys, frustrations, and responsibilities of being a new faculty member. Each year, a new community of fellows, or DOTS, is formed from among those PhDs who are new or relatively new to teaching mathematics, and once a member of that community, you follow that cohort along throughout your career. At the beginning of their membership, fellows meet at three consecutive national meetings, building relationships and trust. After that, there is a lively listserv that acts as a resource for all kinds of questions and information for faculty. The MAA never anticipated how powerful this community would be for its members. We are gradually expanding the size until we can accommodate all those who are eligible. In p proper celebration of Project Next's 25th anniversary this year, Project Next plans to accept at least 100 new fellows, its largest class ever. Chris Stevens, on the creation of Project Next, said, What we discovered was that there was an enormous need for a community, that these new PhDs valued being part of a nationwide community of peers, of people at the same stage of their careers and confronting similar challenges, and that they formed an extremely vibrant and supportive community as they moved through that part of their career. Current Project Next director Dave Kung said, We work hard to develop great sections about innovative, effective teaching. But the most valuable thing we provide is space for new math faculty to meet each other, to create a support group, to build community. An important type of community is one which predominantly serves members of groups underrepresented in mathematics, such as the National Association of Mathematicians, which was founded to promote excellence in the mathematical sciences and to promote the mathematical development of all underrepresented minorities. Among other events, it holds an undergraduate math fest each fall to encourage students to pursue advanced degrees in mathematics. Congratulations to NAM on celebrating its 50th anniversary in 2019. Since its founding in 1971 by a small group of women mathematicians, the Association for Women in Mathematics encourages women and girls to study and have active careers in the mathematical sciences. They have worked to make the environment for women in mathematics more nurturing than it was in the 1970s and 80s, and they have played an important role in increasing the presence and visibility of women in mathematics. I remember fondly as a graduate student in 1990-91 being surprised to be exchanging emails with former AWM president Rhonda Hughes herself, and I was welcomed into the community by being invited to participate in AWM's graduate student workshop. The Society for Advancing Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science fosters the success of members of these underrepresented groups, from college students to professionals in STEM. Its goal is simple yet powerful, true diversity in STEM. Women in Number Theory is a research community supported by the AWM through an NSF advance grant. Their first conference was in 2008. They hold regular conferences and provide a productive research community for women interested in number theory. Based on their success, other research communities for women in math have started in the past 10 years. A partnership between the Iowa State Regents Universities and four historically black colleges and universities in an effort to increase the number of African Americans with advanced degrees in mathematics, started the Math Alliance in 2001. Now a national partnership, the Alliance provides a community for students and underrepresented groups, students of underrepresented groups in mathematics, and promotes their admission to graduate school. 
The Field of Dreams conference each year is a powerful example of the impact of belonging. One participant said, as a black female mathematician who values increasing diversity and inclusion in the mathematical sciences, I was extremely pleased with the number of people of color I saw at the conference. This is the first conference to which I have been where I saw so many, and this was affirming in that it was a reminder that I too belong in this field and proves the face of mathematics is changing with my generation. For the first time, I networked with many female fellow mathematicians who look like me, and this powerful experience truly resonated with me. Executive Director David Goldberg said, if we were going to succeed in our goal of having significant and sustainable impact on our professions, then we would need to build a community of faculty that, to support this effort and to institutionalize best practices as part of the culture within graduate programs. Starting in 2005, Infinite Possibilities Conference is a national conference that is designed to promote educate, encourage, and support minority women interested in mathematics and statistics. This conference grew out of the dreams of three women, Leona Harris, Tanya Moore, and Nagambal Shah, who were looking to build a community based on the elements of their experiences that supported and empowered them in mathematics. Enhancing diversity in graduate education, which began in 1998 as an REU directed by Sylvia Bozeman and Rhonda Hughes, runs a summer bridge program for women, often women of color, who are making the transition between undergraduate and graduate school, providing them with ongoing mentoring and support. Participant Jill Jordan said, I have continued to learn how important community is for mathematicians. There is something so special about making connections through a common interest in math. Members of the EDGE community celebrate good times and help each other through difficult times. Carla Cotwright Williams said, Participation in EDGE changed my life. The opportunity to live and learn amongst like-minded peers all working towards a common goal was a totally different experience than I had as undergrad. I was part of a community. I belonged. Interaction with the EDGE instructors, mentors, guest speakers, and fellow participants empowered me in ways that are immeasurable and priceless. Of these examples that I've given, the sections of the MAA date back to the origins of the MAA over a 100 years ago, perhaps because travel at that time was much more difficult. Communities supporting a particular field of interest or subgroup of the population, however, took longer to come onto the scene, many in just the past 25 years. Why is that? As a profession, we don't set out to create these communities. Often starting these communities has been left up to an individual or a small group of individuals who want to make a change and are willing to put in the energy to do it. These communities play a vital role in the infrastructure of the American mathematical enterprise. What can and should our associations and our funding agencies be doing to support these precious cornerstones? The MAA, for example, has been developing MAA Connect, an online community networking tool and repository that is being tested now and we hope will go live before this fall. MAA Connect will allow communities to more easily form and members within communities to communicate with each other. Another reason may be that much of the research done by the social, social psychologists that I mentioned earlier has been done in the past 25 years. Perhaps we were waiting for evidence that these communities work. And NSF includes grant led by a team of folks who have experience developing and running communities conducted research with two social scientists. A total of 100, uh, sorry, 1,531 past participants from programs listed here were identified. Of those, 198 were randomly selected for a quantitative survey. Of those, 34 who had earned or are working towards a PhD in mathematics were given an extensive qualitative interview. One of the questions they were asked was, do you think you would have stayed in mathematics without your experiences in enrichment programs, conferences, and mathematics? Of those 34, 22 simply said no. Five were unsure. Three were unsure but said they would have been less successful, and four said yes. The full report and two best practices documents appear on the website womendomath.org. Our concern should be the folks who would benefit from feeling like they belong to a community but who don't have access to one. 
our students, our colleagues, ourselves? What should be done if we feel a need for a community that will support you or you see a need for a community to support students within your own classroom or your department or to support others? Create one. American novelist and professor emeritus of Princeton, Toni Morrison, said, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. American mathematician, professor of mathematics at Dartmouth College, and MAA president John Wesley Young, who, with Oswald Veblen, who I mentioned earlier, introduced the axioms of projective geometry, in his retiring presidential address called upon all members of the association to do their part. The roots and trunk and branches of the tree of mathematics are quite as important as the blossom or the fruit, and the former must exhibit healthy life if the latter are to be produced at all. Any other attitude is so utterly stupid as hardly to merit attention. There is important work for all of us. The sin of the mathematician is that he doesn't, is not that he doesn't do research. The sin is idleness when there is work to be done. If there be sinners in my audience, I would urge them to sin no more. Whatever your abilities, there is work for you to do for the greater glory of mathematics. Creating a community may sound overwhelming, but it's really not. Just start small and let things grow organically. How does that work? Well, let me tell you about a community very near and dear to my heart, the Carleton College Summer Mathematics Program for Undergraduate Women, that my... That my colleague, husband, and fellow mathematician Stephen Kennedy and I started in 1995. In 1991, in visiting positions at St. Olaf College, Stephen and I and our St. Olaf colleagues were reading the very interesting and very depressing AMS notices special issue on women in mathematics. We were all deeply affected by the stories and the evidence of the slow progress of women in the mathematical sciences. We wanted to do something to increase the number of women getting PhDs in mathematics, but we weren't sure what. Luckily for us, we were in a good place at a good time. During the 1970s and 80s, the St. Olaf Math Department, under the leadership of future MAA President Lynn Steen, Arthur Seabach, Lauren Larson, and Ted Vesey, grew from a department with 18 majors a year to one with 120 from a faculty of seven to well over 20 when I was there in the 1990s. How did this happen? They intentionally built a welcoming community in the department for anyone who wanted to major in mathematics. The department was led by folks who had a big tent philosophy. A major in mathematics is not just for the strongest, best prepared students, but it's for anyone. C students have to major in something, they would say. What could serve them better than a degree in mathematics? Students would not just click a box to become a major. They would sit down with a faculty member and make a plan for the rest of their four years. The classes they would take and the social aspects of the department that they would partake in. By signing that contract with the department, they were declaring that not only do they belong in the mathematics department, but the mathematics department belongs to them. This intentionally built community did not limit the students who were bound for graduate school. On the contrary, the sheer number of majors and faculty allowed for a richer catalog of offerings. And in fact, St. Olaf became and continues to be one of the leaders of baccalaureate origins of PhDs in mathematics. It was in this ethos that Stephen and I were considering what we could do to support women in mathematics. Now, I myself had had a very hard start as a graduate student and had only persevered because I knew that I wanted to teach at a liberal arts college when I graduated. And I'm nothing if not Iowa stubborn. Now, Angela Duckworth has put a much more pleasant and affirming name to that, grit. I have grit. Had I not had such a clear picture in my head of my future, I doubt I would have finished my degree. I started to unpack why the first few years of graduate school were so unpleasant. When I graduated high school and knew I wanted to teach mathematics, I headed off to a small regional liberal arts college in Iowa. As a first-generation college student, I didn't know that some institutions had more robust mathematics programs than others. 
I thought an undergraduate degree in mathematics was the same regardless of which college or university I attended. I didn't know what I didn't know, so I didn't know what questions to ask. I picked an undergraduate institution that seemed comfortable when I visited, and I didn't even consider looking at its offerings. This college was a great place for me, but it was not a great place to prepare for graduate school in mathematics. During my senior year as an undergraduate, I was accepted to Northwestern University. Frankly, other than not being required to submit my math GRE scores, I have no idea why I was accepted. At the upper end of my undergraduate math major, I had taken a reading course in Real Analysis 1 because Real Analysis wasn't offered at my school. And on my transcript, I had taken Abstract Algebra 1. But actually, our professor had quit in the middle of the term, so it was more like half a semester of Algebra 1. I was unprepared to start graduate school. At Northwestern, when I visited as an accepted student, there were about 40 faculty, two of whom were women, and there were about 40 graduate students, and I remember one woman. My entering class in graduate school was 12 students, and you might imagine that 11 of them were male, but that was not the case. My advisor, Don Sari, loves to tell the story about stopping by the graduate student chair, George Gasper's office, the summer before my class arrived. He asked George how many women we had in the entering class, and George, who had a reputation for being a great guy but perhaps a little scattered, had said, oh, I don't think we have any. Don had expressed his frustration because hadn't hadn't they as a department agreed they were going to try to increase the number of women? And shouldn't George be doing something about that? George said he had just taken the best 12 candidates. But when Don picked up the list and looked at it, he said, George, half of these are women. George was surprised. (laughs) I didn't look like the professors or older graduate students. I didn't have the mathematical background of my colleagues. But in that entering class that was half women, I found my little community. I belonged. I studied, we studied together and worked together. We ate french fries together and blew off steam together. We formed a mutually supportive community. By our second year together, we were more confident and self-assured from our sense of belonging, so much so that we gussied up Lunt Hall and invited all the faculty and graduate students to the first annual Lunt Hall Ball. So while thinking in the early 90s about how we could increase the number of women earning PhDs, Stephen and I thought we should help them avoid some of the pitfalls that I had encountered. We weren't really sure what we were doing, but we did have the model of the St. Olaf Math Department inspiring us. We had seen the amazing power of an intentionally built mathematical community. We had seen its effects on the students and faculty who lived in it. We thought we could help women make the transition to and through graduate school with a two-pronged approach. We would run a summer program for women finishing their first or second year of undergraduate to give them the mentoring and advice they needed to to prepare for and get into graduate school at a point in their careers when it's still early enough to adjust their schedules. And we would set them up with a community of women with similar interests to have their backs and remind them at those crucial moments that they belong. In 1995, we started the Carleton College Summer Mathematics Program for Women, initially in conjunction with our good friends at St. Olaf. Carleton has always been supportive and recognized, um, and recognized early on that creating this community was an important part of our professional work, much as John Wesley Young had recognized the many important roles that mathematicians can play in the building of American mathematics. The NSA provided early funding, and the NSF funded us for all 18 summers that we ran between 1995 and 2014. A special shout-out goes to Lloyd Douglas, our program officer for many of those years, who understood what we were doing and believed in us. We were trying to build a supportive community to even the playing field before much or all of the social science research I mentioned earlier gave evidence of its value. And he understood. In fact, if you look at the list of former recipients of AMS's programs that make a difference, 
Many of us came into being because of Lloyd's vision. After 2014, although we made several proposals to continue this program, the NSF was looking for other more cost-effective ways to move the needle on the underrepresentation of women in mathematics. The program was for four weeks each summer for 18 undergraduates finishing their first or second year. They all had shown interest in mathematics, but most weren't even declared math majors yet, and many were only one or two courses past linear algebra. Many of these women we chose were from small undergraduate institutions which didn't necessarily provide them with a robust preparation for graduate school, much like my own background. Each summer, the young women would be surrounded by their women peers and amazing women instructors and role models who came to visit or teach in the program. They took two challenging courses in mathematics. The students, who were students just finishing their first or second year of undergraduate studies, studied such topics as low-dimensional topology, piatic analysis, Lie algebras, supermetric spaces, and Morse theory by taking classes, doing homework, and studying together. Through this work, they learned how to write better proofs, rise to a challenge, work well with and support others, and give presentations together. They received mentoring about making the most of their undergraduate math major and how to apply, survive, and succeed in graduate school, as well as conversations large and small about becoming women mathematicians. Throughout all of the activities, we wove as much social time as possible with the directors, the visitors, and the participants. We went canoeing or tubing on the river, hiking through the hills, making dinner together. In fact, my own two children, who spent every summer of their childhood with SMP participants and staff, have a wonderfully warped view of American mathematics, <laughs> where mathematicians are, by and large, women. Between classes, homework, hiking, and dining together, they formed a community, a sisterhood that would outlast the summer program. Throughout the school year, the students would reach out to each other with questions and support on an email list server. If they wanted advice about what classes to take to prepare for graduate school, what mathematical thing they could do with their summers, or how to celebrate Pi Day, they would soon hear from their peers with suggestions and support. Stephen and I thought of each of our summer programs as its own little community, women who knew each other and shared a common four weeks in Northfield with the knowledge and stories that accompanied it. Since they were undergraduates scattered across the country, it was unlikely that they would ever meet each other. But as those of you in the audience who work with undergraduates know, they grow up. Since our participants came to us when they had finished their first or second year of undergraduate, the time it would take them to finish a PhD would be seven or eight or so years after their SMP summer. We celebrated when Suzanne Boyd, a student in our, in our uh, first summer program, earned, uh, finished her PhD at Cornell in 2002. She wrote to our community, this past year wins by a mile the roughest, craziest, most frustrating year of my life award. Applying for jobs, finishing my dissertation, and arranging to move all at the same time. If any of you out there will be finishing your thesis sometime in the next few years, feel free to give me a call and chat about the process. It's okay if we've never met before. Just tell me that you went to SMP. By the start of 2005... We had seven members of our community who had earned their PhDs. Leading up to the joint mathematics meetings in Atlanta, Georgia that year, we heard from a few of our SMP graduates that they would be going to the JMN and wanted to see us. We contacted a local Italian restaurant and sent emails to all the list servers for the various summer programs that we were, wel that we were welcome to meet them for dinner. Then I began to worry. What were we going to do with these women? They'd be at all different stages of their careers, and by and large, they wouldn't know each other. I made plans. Those of you who know me well will not be surprised to learn that I made lists of activities to help them to get to know each other. I was prepared. But Stephen and I were late for dinner. By the time we arrived, 10 minutes after the scheduled start, 30-some women were seated and chatting with each other with the ease of established friendship, though they had just met. The PhDs were giving advice to the graduate students who were giving advice to the undergraduates. 
There was talk of REUs and senior theses and choosing advisors and looking for jobs. There was so much talk, we couldn't have used any icebreaker activities if we tried. Their comfort came from their sense of belonging. This experience was an epiphany for us. We thought we had to play a more active role in manipulating a group into a community. But really, we just needed to get together some amazing women in a safe space and allow the community to form naturally. We also learned the value of a vertically integrated community. We didn't need to find established women at various stages of their careers to be a resource for our students. We already had S&P graduates at those stages who were more than willing to help out giving advice. So that summer... After another batch of SMPers finished their PhDs, we started a symposium for SMP graduates who had earned PhDs in mathematics to come back to Carleton during the summer and talk to each other about their research, get career advice from the instructors and directors, and mentor the current summer program participants. The first year we do, did this, I remember nine young women PhDs sitting in front of the 18 participants preparing to answer questions about graduate school. One of the undergraduates in the front row, a few feet from the nascent PhDs, looked back and forth between where she was sitting and where they were sitting a mere few few feet away. She was clearly imagining them sitting where she was, in the same program, just a few years earlier. And she said out loud, Wait, they all have PhDs? This is so cool. We continued the summer program and symposium, and with each year we'd rejoice in the new PhDs coming out the other end. A back-of-the-envelope calculation shows that SMP alumni persist to a PhD at a rate much greater than non-SMP alumni. Comparing the number of women entering graduate school in groups 1, 2, and 3 departments of mathematics in the years 2001 to 2005, and the number of women finishing PhDs from those same departments in the years 2006 to 2010, shows that there is about a 26% persistence rate to PhD. The persistence rate to Ph.D. for SMP alumni from 1995 to 2005 who entered mathematical science Ph.D. programs is about 63%. This high, higher persistence rate was not a result of us cherry-picking women from the strongest undergraduate institutions in the U.S., Our participants went on to earn PhDs from a variety of undergraduate institutions, including Holy Cross, Xavier, Gettysburg, Alfred, University of Akron, Kenyon, Kalamazoo, Pacific Lutheran, Huntington. They were finishing their first or second year as an undergraduate, and we only had four weeks to teach them any mathematics. But what we were able to give them that lasts a lifetime was information, mentoring, and a community to which they belonged and with which they felt a connection. A participant said, My summer at SMP helped me become both more logical and more creative in my thinking. It helped me learn how to grapple with new and challenging concepts, and it allowed me to develop these skills in a community that was rigorous and challenging while still fundamentally very supportive. I think that last part is what makes SMP so special, how the program challenges you while also affirming that you, as a young woman, belong in the field. A few years later, we had some funds left at the end of a grant cycle, and we wanted to make an opportunity to check in in on our SMP graduates who were in graduate school. We were seeing students in the middle of their undergraduate education at the summer program, and then after they'd finished their PhDs in the symposium. We needed to check in on them in the middle. So with the help of SMPers, Jen Bowen, Catherine Crowley, Alyssa Kranz, and Pam Richardson, we started a graduate education mentoring workshop on the day before JMM. This was an opportunity for graduate students to get advice and mentoring on issues relevant to them during graduate school. They also presented many practice talks and received feedback on their talks. This continued every January before the JMM. 
Around the same time, we were happy with how the symposium with SMP PhDs was going. The PhDs were great role models for the undergraduates, but weren't around them long enough. So we asked a couple of them each summer to come for a long period of time, two weeks to the whole month, and be mathematicians in residence. They would model by their very presence what it meant to be a modern woman mathematician. These MERS would spend their days doing mathematics in a quiet, airy library at Carleton, and they would spend their evenings and weekends in social time being threads in the fabric of the students' community. Our last addition to the structure of the program before we became defunded was to add an optional outreach afternoon to the already busy schedules of the undergraduates. I set it up so that they could go one afternoon during the summer to an enrichment program in a blue-collar town nearby. They played mathematical games with children who were recent Somali immigrants, and they literally tied in mathematical knots at-risk children at a nearby camp. We made it an optional activity because we already stretched the SMP participants in many different directions. But not to our surprise, when the sign-up sheet went around, all SMPers signed up to participate. They knew the importance of mentoring and community and wanted these kids to have a similar experience. Jen Bowen said, SMP was the beginning of my mathematical mentoring journey. I not only benefited from my mentors, but simultaneously this mathematical community facilitated me becoming a future mentor. I now serve as department chair at a small liberal arts college, advisor to many math majors, but also as part of the Posse Foundation as a faculty mentor to 10 students. SMP gave me the motivation to sustain a graduate student mentoring program for eight years at the JMM and now an experiential learning program, Women Who Count, at my own institution. I am forever grateful and proud to be part of the SMP community. Pam Richardson said, my SMP family is incredibly supportive. I always feel like the community wants me to succeed, and everyone will do what they can to make sure that happens. I gain lifelong friends, not just professional colleagues through SMP. Becky Swanson wrote, as a college sophomore from a tiny school in the middle of nowhere, I arrived at SMP thinking that I would learn some mathematics for a few weeks in the summer, and that would be it. Little did I know that when I was jo- what I that I was joining a lifelong community. I certainly learned some very interesting mathematics, but just as importantly, or more importantly, I developed friendships and made connections with other women interested in math. It was at SMP that my instructor, Karen Brooks, asked me if I was planning to go to graduate school. It was the first time that anyone had asked me that question. It was a life-changing moment in which I began to realize that I belonged to a mathematical community. The summer program is no longer running, but the SMP community is still alive, well, and strong, and I am proud and thankful to be a member. Of the 343 young women who entered our community when they were undergraduates, 102 now hold PhDs in the mathematical sciences. Six more hold PhDs in cognate disciplines. About 80 more hold terminal master's degrees and 41 more are still in graduate school. That is, two-thirds of the students who came to SMP as first- or second-year undergraduates with some nascent interest in mathematics now hold advanced degrees in the mathematical sciences. Funding SMP was an investment in the future of American mathematics, and it's still paying off each year with women finishing PhDs master's degrees, and entering careers in business, industry, and government. Interest has also been accruing on this investment. Each of these women understand the value and importance of belonging to a community, and they have gone on in their own ways to pay back this investment tenfold. Jasmine Ng wrote, I can honestly say that graduate school was such a pleasant experience because I knew that I was never alone and had the entire SMP network to support me during any obstacle that came my way. Melinda Linnaeus wrote, SMP is where I realized that I could be a mathematician and that this was a possible career path for me. Because of this program, I discovered and attended Budapest semesters in mathematics. Because of this program, I applied to and attended an REU. Because of this program, I went to graduate school in math. 
However, the most important thing SMP became to me is an extended math family. I never expected to be able to connect to so many wonderful math women across all stages, from applying to graduate school all the way to having made it in an established career. SMP isn't just a program, it is a giant supportive family. Kristen Courtney wrote, Beyond a summer program, which in itself was enriching and rewarding, SMP has created a network of confident and informed women in mathematics who constantly and consistently support, encourage, and enable one another. This web of connections has bolstered and emboldened so many women to pursue a career in mathematics and to persist when faced with the inevitable difficulties therein. I will readily count myself among these, and for that and so much more, I thank you. A few concluding thoughts. First, if we are intentional in building communities, we can support people who already do mathematics, and we can welcome into mathematics members of populations who have not traditionally felt that they belong here. Isn't a goal of all of us true diversity in STEM? It's incumbent on all of us to do what we can. Secondly, building communities, welcoming people into mathematics, is incredibly professionally rewarding and not that hard. Building the SMP community has made my professional career truly amazing and more personally gratifying than you can imagine. Stephen and I puff up with pride whenever we hear of the graduations career placements, advanced degrees, and news of relationships and births from our SMPers. They are our family. Rachel Matra wrote, SMP was a wonderful experience. Thank you, Deanna and Steve, for this gift of community to a generation of women mathematicians. From the fascinating courses to the collegial environment fueled by Deanna and Steve's spirit of generosity, inclusion, and joyous adventures of mathematics, I remember SMP fondly and credit it as guiding force along my path to realizing a life in mathematics. Moreover, the positive effects of SMP did not end with the summer. Deanna and Steve have created an ongoing community through the symposiums and newsletters. Mathematics as a whole, women mathematicians in particular, and I personally owe them a big thank you. With a heart full of appreciation, admiration, and pride, let me say a big thank you to all the SMPers for making my career so rich and rewarding. Third, these women, too, have made their own inroads into building communities and welcoming new generations in. Building a community has an exponential positive effect on the future of mathematics. Fourth, you can do it. Create a community in your classroom, in your department, amongst your graduates. Tell them that they are welcome. They are not alone. They belong. Finally, the MAA with all you wonderful, supportive folks is my community, my family, my home for my professional career. I belong here. I thank you for the opportunity to serve as your president. It has been my honor. Thank you.